Well, thank you very much, Simon. And uh, uh, yeah, let's kick off. This is um, I'm going to I'm going to deal with the, the introduction to AMCs. I'm going to leave the difficult stuff for Drian and Keith. You know all the analytical stuff. I have to warn you, Drian is an auditor, so don't fall asleep during that portion. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to give the overview, um, and then I'm going to lead into Drian's core equity AMCs. Next slide. Yeah. So just a little bit of background about AMCs. They've been around a while now on the JSE, just over a year. Um, at last count, there was 32 in August, but there were six or seven more listed in the last couple of weeks. So that's probably closer to 40 now. Uh, we have a market cap of, it's just gone over 10 billion, I believe, uh, of assets in AMCs. So it's actually quite a large portion of the market now. And I've, I've once called these things the, the potentially the collective investment scheme killers because uh, you can do a lot with AMCs, and and you can see some of the names that have launched uh, AMCs in the last in the last year. You've got Efficient. Some of these names will, you you guys will know, uh, Momentum, etc. But there's a lot of the boutique managers that have also launched uh, their own AMCs, and and some interesting ones. I mean, there's some commodity ones. Uh, there's clearly offshore and local equities. So we're we're seeing some nice sort of uh, investment strategies coming through on these AMCs. So this is a quote from Valdina. I've got three quotes that I want to share with you. And this is just kind of giving you an idea of what the JSC's view and, and the asset manager's views are on, on these products. So Valdina, this is a quote from a year ago where she was, when they, when they launched the new uh, uh, specialized securities uh, AMCs. Uh, and the, the, the thing about the AMCs is their flexibility uh, and the ability for retail clients to trade them and their cost effectiveness for a retail client to buy in a, into a fairly diversified portfolio uh, of underlying. This is from Adele. This is uh, from last week. This is actually from our listing of our AMCs last week. And uh, essentially, once again, uh, access to individual investors looking for access to listed financial markets and the benefits. And, and I think that is the key thing for AMCs. They're easy to trade in your, in your stockbroking account, and they do give you very easy access to a spread uh, of underlying shares, both local and offshore. And the last one, you always have to have a bank involved in, in issuing an AMC, so it's issued off a bank balance sheet. And uh, the ones we listed uh, last week uh, with, with UBS, uh, with Avashin and, and his team there. And, and basically, these the AMCs are, are listed and, and traded off the bank's balance sheet. And as you can see, Avashin is saying it's not just for local, local it's both uh, you can access global uh, strategies as well in an AMC. And of course, the most important quote is my own. So clearly, we launched our first uh, AMCs that we launched were very core equity AMCs, that's uh, broad-based ones, and John's going to talk about those. And then we were excited last uh, last week to launch the smaller mid-cap portfolios with Keith, who will talk about that just now. And and what we've done is we've used these AMCs to, to create both local and uh, offshore, offshore diversified portfolios for our clients. And that is our listing last week. And uh, we should be able to spot Drian and Keith uh, in the crowd there. I was unfortunately absent because I was in France watching rugby. So I had to leave it to the underlings uh, to look after things. But you can see we had a successful listing on the exchange. And uh, yeah, and we've had quite a nice support from the retail client base so far. So just taking a couple of through some of the details on what AMCs are. So effectively, they they act like a they act like a unit trust. They act like a CIS. So it's typically a basket of securities. They um, and it's run by a portfolio manager. That will be typically a Cat two discretionary manager. Could be an authorized member of the JSC or a foreign asset manager. They're regulated by the JSC. So what you're getting is a highly regulated instrument. They're listed in terms of Section Nine specialist securities, and these are things like exchange traded notes or exchange traded products. So AMCs fit into that category. They're run by a discretionary portfolio manager. In our case, both of our portfolio managers are on this call, Keith and Keith and Drill. Um, and they're really used by retail clients who want to get access to these strategies. And and typically in the past, what, what would have happened, we would have run a seg portfolio, a segregated uh, mandate for these clients. This allows us to pool all of that money together and run one strategy uh, for the clients. They're listed and traded and settled in RAND, so they're on the JSC, they're in RAND, and, and that's important. I'll come back to that just now. And a market maker like UBS, who, who listed our uh, uh, AMCs, will be there to create liquidity, a bit off a spread, which is, which is important if you want to get in and get out of the product.
as I said, listed listed uh, typically started off with uh, listed uh, SA securities. Now what what's happened is guys have added commodity strategies. Uh, we're seeing some bond strategies come in. There's a private credit strategy that's come into one of the AMCs. So what you're getting here is an active strategy as opposed to the the the, the traditional passive ETFs that we're used to. You're getting hopefully the best of an active manager, but within a vehicle that almost acts like a passive passive instrument. Uh, high degree of customization, as I said, lots of different asset classes coming through um, and fairly cost effective for a retail client. Um, from our point of view, what it allows us to do is, is use the scale of the JSE to distribute out to retail clients very easily. And it also brings down our operational and our administrative burden on running these portfolios. So lastly, the key benefits, this is from ABSA Capital from one of their slides, really the uh, offers distribution, ease of, ease of access for retail clients, allows the portfolio manager to express himself in a listed instrument. It brings down that operational burden. The investment universe is very wide, as I said. We haven't seen anybody bring a currency one in yet, but I'm sure it's coming. But mostly it's been equities, local and offshore equities. Um, the one thing is useful is from a client who's run out of their offshore allowance, they can use the AMC because it's RAND denominated. It doesn't use up your, your offshore allowance. So it gives you access to offshore strategies uh, without having to use your foreign investment allowance. And once again, you get a bit of cost saving. It's quite an efficient way of trading a fairly large basket of securities in one trade if you're a retail client. Okay. So the two ways that we use them is we use them for our voluntary clients. So that's clients who would typically open a brokerage account with a JSC member, uh, or they come in via financial advisor or wealth manager, or via a list platform. And they, they a list platform is a, a linked investment service platform. You know it like Glacier, Momentum, 27.4, these sort of platforms. So you can go and buy them using your voluntary money. But what we're finding is a lot of people are putting them also into their pension provident fund, uh, living annuity, retirement annuity, endowments. And, and there we've partnered specifically with guys like Lifecycle, 27.4, Glacier, Wealthport, uh, who are now starting to stock AMCs so that you can now add them into your pension and provident fund. So where do they fit into our lives? Well, we've we fitted them into our local equity. So this is our strategic asset allocation from our, from our income fund up through to our alternative or high growth fund. And you can see that we are quite, quite, we use them to replace our local equity and our offshore foreign equity. And later on, we'll probably add it into alternatives and private maybe uh, alternatives uh, and maybe some commodity play as well. But at the moment, you can see it make, they can make up quite a large percentage of our strategic asset allocation. So where do we fit them into our world? So we tend to work on a, a core and satellite type strategy. So we first launched our core equity portfolios, which is what Drion's going to chat about. Uh, and those were to give broad based uh, al uh, allocation to both the JSC, you know, the, the, the bigger stocks uh, on the JSC, and then the and then offshore. So those were our core equity we launched first. And then we've now started launching what we call our specialized or our satellite equity strategies. What are them being with teeth, the, the small and mid cap uh, strategy. So that's kind of how we build our portfolios. So on that, I'm going to then hand that over to, to Drew who can uh, chat about our core equity strategies. Thanks a lot, Mark. Appreciate that. So the first one I'm going to talk about is our international worldwide Tetra Alpha Index. Um, the name Tetra is meaning three, or uh, four, four. So like a house that meets four pillars to stand on, an easy, you know, building house, nice structure, strong structure, four pillars. Um, and you'll see the, the later on the other strategy for the local also on four pillars or four strategies or buckets as, as we call it in, in here um, with the idea that rather than just using one specific strategy uh, we rather diversify into four different strategies um, and as no single strategy ever over the length of time is ever successful the whole time so so we said, okay, um, we employing multiple strategies into one fund um, and then get better diversification through the use of these multiple um, strategies that, that is employing, that, 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 am I, that, that I'm employing in these funds. 
The, the first one that I want to talk about, a little bit about the strategy as to how these things are working and how, um, how I get to, 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 to constitute um, these funds, is the, is the Factor Fund. Um, now, I don't know how many people have heard of uh, Factor ETFs and, and the five factors and that is being used by, um, by a lot of, of the people that are trying to outperform the indices. Um, and they, we specifically refer to the five factors being size, momentum, quality, um, volatility, and then lastly, value. Now, in our fund, what we've done is we've added um, a sixth one as well, which is TILT, uh, which is effectively a small cup and value um, um, factor that is introduced as well. So, so we've got six different factors that we use. Uh, and rather than us, I mean, we're a very small house um, operation that, that, that we're working at, rather than creating our own factors, um, there's, there's already a lot of factors and things, a lot of clever people that, that are calculating and, re and, and creating new factors and, and running those factors against historical models and trying to outperform and seeing if their factor outperforms and, and they, they, they go about it, get, like multiple quant teams doing that type of thing, we've decided, okay, we're rather going to, 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 to see um, and to use what is already available and what is being used and created by some of these very smart people. Um, and we have picked 12 different factor ETFs, um, both internationally and US. And we then, or, or I then, at the end of every month, um, reconstitute the file by by looking at these factors and to see which factors have contributed the most to the return in the previous month and using that methodology to say okay well where there's momentum um, we expect the trend to continue and then we allocate more into into that area um, for that um, specifically on the factor side um, I'm using some machine learning algorithms um, that I've employed in that model in order to then um, tell and, and calculate the, the allocation into each one of the, the 12 factors. Um, some month, if the model predicts that um, something is, is not is completely going to underperform, um, some of the factors are even excluded. For instance, at the moment, I'm just looking at the detail here. Um, the U.S. value factor has got a 0% allocation uh, for the current month of September. Um, so with the biggest allocation that was sitting in the, the volatility, um, which, interest, which is quite interesting, uh, taking that we had quite a bit of volatility and the market fell quite a lot. So yeah, it looks like the model uh, worked quite effectively this last month. Then, Moving on to the other the other strategies, um, the regional and the sector strategies, they're also um, computer driven, computer driven and code driven. Um, everything coded in Python um, on the regional and the sector. And what I'm do, the, the, on the regional side, there's 20 different um, countries, country ETFs that is included in that model. On the sector side, there's um, 11 sectors that is included. The sectors what I'm referring to um, would be things like um, information technology, energy, um, consumer discretionary, consumer staples, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And what I do there is I compare what is the performance um, over a, a period, over a backtested period um, against the benchmark and I then identify also amongst themselves. And then I can and see which one of, let's say if I take the sectors, I then say, okay, which of the sectors are performing the best um, in respect of the other sectors. And I also look at momentum of each one of these and what is the strongest with the most momentum gets the most over allocation and what's the weakest um, with the, within and the, uh, basically momentum in the wrong direction. Um, that gets the, the, the most under allocation um, in the specific month. That same principle is employed also in the regional allocation. Um, yeah, so that's, that's what I can say about those. 
Then in terms, then the last one is this, no, no, just go back, just go back. Uh, then the last one is sentiment. The sentiment, which I'm still working on on a, on a computerized model because so I do like to just push a couple of buttons and let the computer decide what, what should be done. Um, take the human um, factor completely out of it because um, we humans tend to sometimes become emotional and make emotional decisions. And by employing computers and getting it rule-based and into, into the computer, um, that is eliminated. Now, unfortunately, on the sentiment side, I haven't been able to, to get that model um, completely, completely um, computerized. Um, I've looked at a couple of options there. One of the, the, the main ones when we look at sentiment would be um, looking at the volatility um, index, um, the VIX index in, in the US. Um, but I find it's completely volatile. It's a very daily index and it's not suitable for, for longer term investment, which this is intended to be. So that, that, that has not worked at all. So currently what we're doing is we're looking at um, at macroeconomic um, factors um, and just following macroeconomics worldwide, looking at what the, the, the US is doing, what the Fed is doing, um, looking in, in Europe, what's happening there in terms of interest rates, in, in terms of the market sentiment. And then based on what we, what, then me and Mark would have a discussion around that. And then we, then we will either overweight um, on the beta um, and we then go straight against um, there are some, um, some instruments where one can, can two, two times and then we just proportion it um, on, the, on, a, on, a, on, on the all world um, ETF so you can, can, can get geared and then we would just gear it according to how much overweight we want. Similarly currently where we're at um, in the last month we were underweight and what we've done was um, in the allocation and we've got 10% of the fund that we allocate into the segment. And, and we did a 50% allocation to cash and 50% into straight into the, the ETF, the all world. So, um, so again, it was the right call for the last month that we did on this and that one. But, and then, so 10% allocation for sentiment and then the other three strategies are divided equally 30% into each one of the other three strategies. In, in terms of the, the overall allocation of the fund. Thanks, Simon. Okay, now here, this is an extremely busy chart, um, but what are the point that I'm wanting to try and make here, or that I want to make is, if we start, uh, yeah, we had a bit of a chuckle here beforehand, saying that we must look at charts and start at the bottom left and go to the top right. So if we look at the information technology um, sector, which ends at the, the top um, right, you'll see it actually started with a, with a total underweight at the beginning of, of the year. This is for this year, the allocation and the percentage over and under allocation. We, we, we kept the over and under allocation at about 25% um, on any sector. And what you'll see here is very quickly um, during the first four months, we realized that information technology is the place to be. And that was where we did all of our, the majority of our allocation going over 20% over allocation in. Then interestingly, um, over the term of our look here at the S&P 500 year to date, um, 30 to the, the information technology sector had a 32% return for the year. So that, that then is completely justified why we had the allocation and the, the machine and the code actually produced the right results, exactly what we wanted. Um, the second, well, the first um, highest year-to-date um, performance, if I look here, is the sitting in the telecommunications with a 38% return um, year-to-date um, in terms of the S&P 500. Then if we look what our model has done, that is the blue line communication. Um, you'll note that we've been, from the beginning of the year, we've been over, uh, over, over allocated in that sector. And we've done so through pretty much the whole year. And then the last one is, um, that is, is the consumer discretionary. But you'll see also a big over allocation pretty much the whole year. And that's interestingly the third best performer this year with a 23% return 
um, in the consumer discretionary on the S&P 500. Just to give that context, S&P 500 for the year to date is up 11.33%. So that's quite a bit better than the, than the index have done. And our allocation using this strategy was fairly accurate. Um, then on the under allocation consumer staples, was, we had the most under allocation in consumer staples and with about 20% and consumer staples have been negative 6%, 6.6% in, in the year. So that just explains a little bit about what we do and how the over and under allocation actually talks to what the performance and the sector performance and things has been. Thanks, thanks, Simon. Similarly, even, even, even worse than the previous one, and um, this is now on the countryside. Now there's 20 different countries that is being thrown in here. Um, and again, if we look at the charts that start bottom left and go to the top right, uh, no surprises there, it's the United States. The uh, United States has been outperforming this year. Uh, almost all the other indices in, in the world, um, just looking at actual performance. S&P 500 is up 11.33% for the year. Um, the, then we've got the, the DAX that is up 9.29%. Um, CAC 7.97% up, 1.9 uh, for the FTSE 100. Um, all share, unfortunately, we've been down here to date, 1.2. This was a snapshot that I took during the day. Um, I, know, I did see late in the market, we, we did um, have some recovery, so probably that's, that will be now will be a bit more than the down 1.2% as at the end of today. Um, the Mainland China CSI 300 was down, is down 4% year to date, and Hang Seng um, in Hong Kong is down basically 11%. And if we look at, and we, if we look back and translate it here, you can see China, which is the slightly more um, the yellow, but it's it's more of a massive the yellow. You'll see it here at the bottom on the right. Um, and, and you can see we've got a very, very big under allocation to um, in that um, and because of the extremely bad performance um, that China has done. Interestingly, the model um, does try and correct itself very quickly. Um, during um, the July period, um, China tried to try to rally and we quickly the model quickly tried to adjust itself um, uh, with an allocation from 10% unallocation to almost equal allocation, um, but yes, it just then continued to fall again. So, so similarly to what we've seen on the sector side, um, we basically, we say we back the winners um, and we allocate towards the winners and the losers, we, we, we stay away from, from the losers and we underweight um, the losers. Then, um, when in, in, in deciding the over and under weights, and we look at the actual index, um, the all world index, and, and I then look at the detailed file. Okay, maybe that's too much detail. Uh, I'll skip that. Mark said I'm an auditor. I might give too much detail or talk too much detail. So let's go to the next slide. Okay, actual performance. This is the factor models performance. The, and this is com a complete, completely AI driven model uh, that's based on machine learning algorithms. As you can see for the majority of the period since it's been listed, um, it has outperformed. Um, you, you'll see none of the funds that, that, that I manage. I don't try to completely over, like, like outperform the market by by vast amounts, I just try to beat the markets by little bits, little increments over time and cons consistently by small increments to, to beat the market. Um, and that's the aim that I have. Unfortunately, um, this, this, this one was kind of beaten by itself. It was beaten by AI, um, as in um, some of the other panelists here, I'm sure you'll remember. I think it was either the 3rd or the 4th of May um, when NVIDIA came out and they they started talking up um, on the on the AI um, and what they expected to get and an increased tail that they are getting that they expected to get I think it was an increase of about 50 percent 
that they forecasted for the next quarter increase. Um, so it was very big increase that was suddenly expected um, on the back of generative AI. Um, everybody, ChatGPT became a household name. So every man and his dog jumped on it. Um, that happened within the month of May. And unfortunately, uh, we weren't able to capture uh, much of, of, of that move. Um, because we had already reconstituted before that period and we and afterwards um, it actually fell. But nonetheless, you can see it peaked, it pretty much peaked there in, in, in July um, and we are catching up again and we are now only ever so slightly behind. Um, and yes, this is, this is just over one year's performance um, of the fund and um, I'm quite happy with with the, with the performance um, that, that that this AI has given us so far. Um, then, thanks, Simon. On to the next one. This is if we if we throw absolutely everything together, all those different strategies. Um, you you'll see overall performance overall performance since listed last year September. Um, it is trailing slightly by one and a half. 1.4%, 1.43%, the, the, the actual. So um, index, so I'm not completely happy about this. Um, but yes, I know the reasons for it and therefore can do something about it. Um, and part of doing something about it is also to, to get something automated on the, on the sentiment side so that we can, we can work better on, on, in that area. Um, Okay, thanks. That's all I want to say about this one. Okay, now on to the SA listed. Now this one we only listed in June this year, so this is fairly new. And um, again, similar to the international, this is again four pillars um, that we're using. Um, and this is again uh, machine driven, computer machine language driven. Um, in, 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 and in this, what I do is I've got a scoring mechanism where I use um, uh, but I only use the, the JSE mid and large cap, which is the J206 index on, on, on the JSE. And currently it's now only got 70 shares, four shares dropped out uh, with this September reconstitution. It's unfortunately the JSE's listings is dwindling. So my investment universe for this one is, is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, yeah, I'm not very happy about that. Anyways, let me carry on. Um, so what I then do is I use um, different, I use fundamental analysis as well as technical analysis, um, price movement and sentiment, um, and use that in order to derive a score and um, different scores. These scores become features into the, into the machine learning model. Um, and then that, that I then use to, to predict um, a two, two, month, two month forward return, and that is then used to allocate and to select um, which shares that, that I want to, want to be invested in for, for the next month. Um, the, just a little bit more detail, uh, I've got 20 minutes, I'm running out of time, so maybe I, shouldn't, you know, maybe I don't need to talk about all the detail too much here, but on the fundamentals, we're looking at the actual results and reliability, of earnings and we're using the dividend discount model for valuation purposes. On the technical analysis side, there's a couple of different um, technical analysis indicators um, that I'm using um, in order to, to get a, a score for technical analysis. Um, on the price movement side, using linear regression, um, the trend is your friend, that old adage um, that, you, that, you, that you hear a lot of the technical analysts always say. Um, so in order for that, I use linear regression, uh, three different period linear regression, um, long term, medium term and short term um, with different crossover points and everything. And OK, well, that's, that's a whole lot of things into you know, saying about the, the actual features into the model. And the last one is sentiment. Um, unfortunately, on um, SA sentiment, um, we don't have so many so many people tweeting and things and, and, and on our local stocks and and on every one of our local stocks in, in, in the um, to, to, in that universe in a, in a mid and large cap. Ideally, what I would have liked to have done would have would have used more of the social media and do the scraping of social media and then to calculate the sentiment 
um, based on what people are saying about it, but it's not a reality in, in our market. So, so what I've what I've done as a workaround is to say, okay, um, I'm using as a proxy what analyst ratings are doing, and whether and I look on a monthly basis, are analysts and um, the financial analysts um, are they um, downgrading or upgrading the different shares, and that then informs my feature going into that, and that's the four pillars for the local local fund. Thanks, Simon. Okay, I've talked about most of these already. Um, the only thing here that I want to highlight is, like I said earlier, the goal here is only to outperform the market by a few percent each, each, each year. Um, and history has told us, and Tess has told us that in this space, in the large, large cup of space, over 10 year periods, only 11% of active managers is managing to actually outperform their benchmarks over the longer term. So it's a very difficult thing to do. Um, and rather than trying to take two risks, little bits by increments, I feel is the way to go. And all the funds, again, is rebalanced on, on a monthly basis um, using the various computer algorithms. Thanks, Simon. This is the allocation of the quantum um, of the SA fund as the sectors. Um, this is the actual after reconstitution on the 15th of September. Um, as you can see here, I just want to highlight two things. Basic materials, 25.45% allocated in that sector. Um, the JTR6 allocation was 27.3%, so we did an under allocation in basic materials. And in financials, we had a 30.6% allocation compared to JTR6, which had a 26.8% uh, allocation. So we went over, um, over allocation on financials and under in, in, in materials. And the RESI, as at the, the, when I took the snapshot yesterday, the RESI, the resource 20, was down 5.43% um, over that same period. Um, that we've went underweight and the Finney and the, the, the bank index was basically flat um, over the period. So it was beneficial for us to, to do the over allocation into financials over the term. Um, all share was down 3.24% over that same period. Thanks a lot, Simon. Um, this, these are our um, five top holdings as at um, current, um, Anglo-American, NASPAS, First Rand Standard Bank, we've got quite a, uh, we've got a nice overweight in First Rand Standard Bank. Um, um, interestingly, in the sector for NASPAS, we equal weight, but um, we, over, we overweight um, DRX process um, and we underweight NASPAS. Um, because we the, the model, well, I personally also believe there's more value distraction in NASPAS, but the model seems to be thinking the same. Um, then Anglo-American, we we equally weighted specifically on Anglo-American, even though we are underweighted on, in the sector. And Goldfields, um, we is, is our is our other big holding. So with the with the, the with the current um, avoidance of, of risk and things, maybe we'll see um, an uptake in, in gold um, and, and buying up gold again. Um, so we'll see how that one pans out. Thanks a lot, Simon. This is um, since listing. Um, this one, like I said, we don't have a lot of history in terms of listing. Since it's listed, it's only listed in, in June this year. Um, and normally it's only small, little outperformance, and we've already got um, in these few months um, some outperformance on, on this fund. The blue line is the fund, and the all share is, is the one just below it. Thanks, Simon. Um, this is using the, the model. Unfortunately, this is not, not physically traded, um, but this is back tested. But the model isn't trained over this period. This is when I use and, and deploy the model um, over history on unseen data um, uh, in order to test what is the, the probability that it will produce um, similar results in the actual market when ran. And this was over a five year period. And as you can see, over a five-year period, it's, uh, the model outperformed. The, the all share um, was, was up 30%, and the model was up 41.87%, um, so almost 42%. So, 
So yes, that's about 12% um, um, overperformance over the all share, or about 40% uh, if you have to take it percentage-wise of the 30%. Um, so I'm quite happy with if, if we can achieve this, um, and the, if we believe that AI is working, then then it is all achievable, and, and I'm definitely standing behind um, machines doing do not doing the work for us and. I can't be on top of every single thing the whole time. There's just too much things happening, and I'd rather use a machine to crunch the numbers for me. And this is this is this is what I've got. Thanks, Simon. That's my story. Thanks, uh, Trian. This is uh, Keith speaking. Simon, if you can go to the next slide. I'm from uh, Integral Asset Management. We run uh, two of the portfolios uh, of Unum Notes. Simon, uh, the next slide, please. Uh, the domestic and the global small and mid cap uh, AMCs. So let's let's get briefly into into them. Uh, next slide, please. So first of all, our approach is quite different. Um, we we our investment philosophy really emphasizes the quality. Um, we value conscious. We seek growth, and we like diversification. These should not be wild concepts to anyone, but if you were to look at because we in terms of these portfolios we want to be fully invested um, therefore all opportunity sets are relative and the way we approach it is we prefer good companies over bad companies growing companies over declining companies and we prefer paying as little as possible for them as opposed to paying paying up for very expensive valuations that's where we prefer to invest. So I like to refer to it as a quality bias, but value conscious. Um, thanks, Simon. Next, next slide. So having the satellite, two satellite notes, the obvious question has to be asked is why would we, why should any investor consider investing in small caps? There's two simple reasons, diversification and growth. Diversification is the less obvious one. If you look at the JSE, there's only 40 underlying companies in the top 40 index. Um, but if you're looking at about two to 300 companies the, on the JSE, the vast majority of the JSE is not in fact in the large cap space, it's in the small and mid cap space. Um, and therefore, if you ignore that, you're ignoring a large number of uh, potential investable opportunities. This same statistic is true if you go have a look at the S&P, the NASDAQ, LSE, DAX, anywhere in the world. Um, with the vast, whereas the large amount of market cap lies in the large caps, hence the name, the larger number of opportunity sets lie in the small caps. So we considered small caps to be a good diversification element to most portfolios that are overweight large caps. Uh, the next reason is growth. Now, unfortunately, the graphs are probably a bit small on your screen, but the bottom left graph, graph where the blue line is outperforming the other line, the blue line is the JSE small cap index outperforming uh, the top 40 index. The same thing is true everywhere we go over the world given the large enough amount of time because if you look on the right hand side, the MSCI world small cap index is outperforming the MSCI world index. Now, outperformance and growth is wonderful, but it does come with concomitant higher volatility and therefore this the, to capture these benefits uh, whereas diversification will help you uh, lower risk the volatility that comes with our performance the way you offset that is by investing in this space for the long term um, but that's that's why I think investors should consider this uh, small caps in terms of equity portfolios in fact much larger portfolios as well thanks Simon next slide Getting into the two notes, uh, the first one, we've got the UNAM Small and Mid-Cap South African Equity Portfolio. Its share code is UUSMC. If you punch that into your uh, 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 brokerage platform, you'll find it in a JSE. You can trade it. UBS Mark makes it. The benchmark is the Mid-Cap Index. UBS is the issuer. They've got solid credit. And the reference portfolio advisor fee of 1.25% per annum is materially less than if you had to incur the brokerage to buy all these individual uh, small caps individ on their own, let alone actually pick the right ones. 
uh, what do the current portfolio characteristics look like with, with our quality uh, bias, value conscious, seeking growth and diversification? Well, our objective is to own somewhere between 20 to 30 stocks. We currently own 27 with an average weight of 3.7 in this portfolio, a median market cap of 6 billion. And across the portfolio, the weighted average equity return on equity is 16.1%, so comfortably above the cost of equity in South Africa. Um, if you if you cast your eye to the top right, you can see that we are spread. We've incorporated diversification in the portfolio. We spread across different sectors. Uh, and if you look on the bottom bottom right graph, our portfolio is trading at at a rather rather measly 8.1 times price earnings relative to the benchmark of 8.5, which even that is at a discount to the top 40 of 10.5. Some of our top five holdings is a uh, Santova global 4PL a logistics provider on 5.4 times multiple. It's We expect over the long term, this is an absolutely massive market. It earns majority of its income offshore. Um, whereas the next set of results may not be spectacular. This is a compounding stock to hold for the long term. Spur Corporation, if you've got kids, you've almost certainly been in the Spur. Uh, at a 10 times multiple with a 7% dividend yield and a net cash balance sheet, you've got a new management team in there waking up the sleeping giant and they're doing absolutely great. Grinrod does better and better, the worst Transnet does. The Maputo part, uh, port is the alternate route out for South Africa. Um, it's uh, as a port terminals and railways business that should be trading at multiples of book. Book is a historic measure of the value. If you had to rebuild these assets, cost you far more than they're holding it on book for. Um, we think it's exceptionally cheap. And in fact, I, I would not be surprised if in the next couple of years it, it gets taken over and delisted if it stays at these multiples. Omnia Holdings playing in the fertilizer and explosive space. Uh, once again, net ungeared balance sheet, net cash on their balance sheet. We expect a good flow of dividend share buybacks. Um, this is a business doing really, really well. They've got a superior supply chain to their local competitors um, and they're playing in the right spaces, commodities and food. Uh, Afrimat is one of the best local uh, allocators of capital. Uh, the majority of the bottom line is being determined by iron ore at this point, but in fact, people forget that there is coal, there is increasingly other commodities in their mix, and these guys are the best management team on, on the JSC, picking them up only 11 times a multiple. They just put out the trading updates uh, today with all the other commodity companies reporting down earnings, their, their headline earnings per share is up two to 7%. And don't forget, they've just made a bid for Lafarge, which is a large and very cheap acquisition they're going for that will consolidate a range of advantages for them. So we absolutely back, back them. This is just a flavor of some of the stocks we like in terms of that quality bias. We like growth and we like uh, cheap valuations. Thanks, Simon. On the global side, this is the Unum Global Small and Mid-Cap Equity Portfolio. Share code is UUGSMC. Uh, the G stands for global. You can find that on the JSC. Benchmark being the MSCI World Small Cap Index, once again issued by UBS. Once again, with a portfolio advisor of 1.25%, especially in this case, if you were to go and buy all the underlyings, your global brokerage would be significantly higher than just buying this note in the JSC. Our aim here is to hold between 30 to 40 stocks. Uh, we currently hold 30 at an average weight of 3.3%. The median market cap is $5.5 billion. That translates to about 100 billion rand, just to give you a sense that even though these are smaller mid caps on a global stage, these are very big businesses in their own rights and very, very entrenched and exciting. I had a hundred billion market cap. If they were to come and list on the JSE, they would be in the top 40. Yet on a global stage, 5.5 billion market cap is considered the small cap. The weighted average return on equity in the portfolio is a whopping 21.5% in US dollars. This is a very, very profitable bunch of uh, a bunch of companies. But if you cast your eye to the top right, you can see that we've got a, a nicely diversified split across sectors. 
you look on the bo bottom right, you can see that uh, the whole portfolio is on a weighted average price earnings of 16.7 times, which is at a slight premium to the benchmark of E, let's call it 12, uh, but it is at a significant discount to the S&P 500. Now, that makes it cheaper than the large caps, which is what we'd expect, and is one of the one of the advantages of why we like paying here, playing here. You get good companies at cheaper prices, but the premium to benchmark is our skew towards higher growth, particularly the moment you go offshore. There's some truly spectacular growth stories, um, and really, really uh, defendable businesses of scale that, in fact, are global. Um, we don't mind paying a slight premium. We are value conscious, but we still believe that this portfolio fundamentally is undervalued at 16 times a multiple, should be trading much higher multiple. And in fact, we'll carry on growing. 21 and a half uh, return on equity is really good. The top five uh, holdings, Bosch and Lom Corp is a 170 year old eye care company. It basically invented contact lenses. And if you look at human beings globally, our primary sense is, vi is, is visual. So we are very careful about our eyes and we continue to use more and more screen time, which continues to deteriorate our eyes. Uh, yet, if you look globally, there's only really five major players in the RK space because we we need to really trust the companies to go and stick whatever their product is into our eyes. Bosch and Lom is one of them. The reason it remains a small cap is it was gobbled up years ago by another business, arguably lost into the folds and badly run. And it's been in a process or unbundled, separately listed. It's got a new CEO. It's, it's trading at half the price of its competitors. It's just done a large acquisition from Novartis, adding a large amount of scale, particularly not on the contact lens side, they're strong there, but adding into the uh, solutions, dry eye side, really, really exciting, deeply defensive business at a very low valuation. We expect to grow almost irrespective of what the world does. Um, doesn't matter whether the market is up, whether the Fed hikes or drops, or whether we're in recession or not, we want to see and we will buy the products that help us see. Domino's Pizza delivers a quarter of all the pizzas in in America, basically, what is, they have absolutely spectacular story with massive returns on capital, hugely cash generative, steady share, steadily buying back their own shares, and underappreciated, but they have a very significant Indian business that we quite like as well. They have just recently seen their Chinese business, RPO. This is an underappreciated company with long runway for growth. Levi Strauss. Uh, we all know the brand in denim, that what they are is they're a, a consumer discretionary trading on a 12 times multiple that is globally branded, that is building direct to consumer channels, that is overweight America, yet it has a global brand and increasingly growing offshore and they have a focus to, and they're growing their brand into parallel products. Take note of all the shirts and shoes of Levi's you see walking around you when you're going shopping centers on a 12 times multiple. This is a spectacular steal. Rent-A-Cool Initial is the world's largest pest control business. They've just bought Terminex in America. Absolutely defensive. Uh, I know some ex-CEOs in some of these areas and pest control is an immensely difficult space to get into. Rent-A-Cool Initial is the largest in the world. It is uh, with the acquisition of Terminex, which especially specializes in America. And America keeps lo loves building their houses out of wood and therefore termites are non-discretionary the moment you find them. And Terminex makes a large amount of money of this. This is a, a wonderful business to hold long-term, hugely discretionary, hugely cash generative. Uh, the Terminex uh, really consolidates their position globally, and we expect them to extract a large amount of synergies from, from that. Then finally, Swiss Quote. Uh, Swiss Quote is a Swiss bank with the collapse and the absorption of Credit Suisse into uh, UBS. The world has one less Swiss bank. That means that in a world of increasing, increasing sophistication, increasing risk, increasing taxes, increasing uh, or increasingly less uh, privacy and the like, 
the world needs more Swiss banks and is increasingly demanding that. Swiss quote as a small up and coming, they would still be large in terms of our market, but uh, in, in Switzerland, in terms of Swiss banking, small up and coming, fast growing, very high returns on their capital. They're a wonderful up and coming competitor. We in fact use them in, in our business. We know, know their service intimately. They're constantly growing. Um, and the, they, they add a really unique Swiss banking element in, into our portfolio that we particularly like the vacuum left in the market from Credit Suisse. And we see the beneficiaries being, being the alternative Swiss banks. Um, thanks, Simon. So just summary and conclusion, so we can hopefully leave some time for questions. How do we like to invest? Well, we have a quality bias. We value and growth conscious, and we want to build diversified portfolios. Why would you allocate to small caps? Well, it provides diversification benefits for overweight large cap portfolios. And in the long term, for patient investors, we pick the right stocks, you can get some exceptional growth here and some good outperformance. The two notes that we've launched with, uh, with Unum is the local small and mid cap portfolio and the global small and mid cap portfolio. You can see their codes there. You can tweet at me, I'll send you those codes. Uh, you can find them on the JSE. Unum has access to them. Everyone can trade into them and you can get wonderful and carefully crafted access to local and global small and mid caps through these notes. Thanks very much, Simon. Uh, thank you, gentlemen. We've got a couple of minutes for questions. So here's my favorite fact. Domino's and Google, now Alphabet, listed in the same month about 20 years ago, and you did better being invested in Domino's Pizza. It's outperformed by some distance. Uh, questions coming through. Peter, market maker, and how liquid are these? Keith, market makers, UBS, and liquidity is, I mean, I would say a lot. I mean, not infinite, but a lot. Yes, the market maker for both of the small and mid cap local notes is UBS. I'll let Drion answer for, for his notes. And uh, the as a market maker, they they guarantee they guarantee making the market. So yeah. nothing's infinite, but ab absolutely as much as you can throw at it, they can probably absorb. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna also chip in on that in terms of the market maker and liquidity. So yes, uh, on Drion's one, one of them is UBS and the other one is uh, Leontech. Uh, Leontech is a, a, a European uh, market maker. Um, if you do enough size, the market maker will typically meet you sort of in the middle of the double mm -hmm. plus a couple of base, basis points. Otherwise, if you're very small and you just want to go and lift the market, there is a bit of a spread always around uh, the net, uh, net asset value. So yeah, UBS have given us an undertaking to be there in the market on these products. Uh, Christopher's asking if you can download. Yeah, Christopher, the presentation and the video will be up on justonelap.com uh, early tomorrow morning. You can watch the video. You can download the presentation. Johan, you're asking a retired uh, retail investor, five to 10-year investment horizon. Uh, why would I choose an AMC versus an ETF? I'm going to give the one-word answer, and then I'll hand it over to, to, to the other folks. Uh, Johan, I think the key difference is, is, is range. I mean, we, we've got a lot of ETFs, but we've also got five S&P 500 ETFs, which is about four too many. Now, I know why we have five, and I know that we will continue to have five, but what we don't have is, for example, a, a, a global uh, a, off, or offshore small cap and the like. We're missing, I think, a, a fair bunch, particularly perhaps in the more niche space, and this is where uh, AMCs come in. Uh, Mark Keith, if you've got to add to that? Uh, thanks, thanks, Simon. I'm, I'm just going to jump in with, with my comment, and you're absolutely right. If you look in the, if you go back three slides back to the South African small and mid cap uh, one, you'll see that 9% of the JSC's market cap is sits in the small and mid cap space. But in the unit trust space, it is the assets allocated to is less than 0.2%. So you're gonna struggle to find good access there. First of all, on the local side. And second of all, if you go to the next page, uh, Simon, in terms of pure, global small and mid cap access there is literally nothing else in south africa there's no etfs there's no etns there is not a single dedicated small and mid cap unit trust glo globally that is accessible in south africa that i'm aware of and i've looked at 
almost everything, but may, mm -hmm. maybe there is. So this is an absolutely unique portfolio as well, and this is an entry point into it. Uh, Mark, I'm, I'm not sure if you'd like to add. No, I, my answer is we do both. I mean, we buy passive when we, when we want to buy cheap and we want to just track an index. And when we want a curated, uh, well thought through solution, we'll buy smart beta or active strategies. So I, I'm, I'm related back to beer. When I'm hot and I'm sweaty, I'll just drink a lager. But when I want some real quality, I'm going to go for a craft beer. So I think it, it's a bit of both for me. Yeah, I think it is, and it's that building those portfolios, and then of course there's still the, the discretionary. Uh, Piers saying uh, Keith's offering is not on easy equities, only offering other stockbrokers. Uh, so there, there will be, and in fact Charles Savage was on on the Twitters today saying uh, as long as there's market maker slash liquidity, and there is, uh, they will be offered. So they're not there. Uh, when I checked earlier yesterday. But they should be there in the next couple of days, let's say early next week. Uh, two other questions that Pierre has: Can it be included in I the tax? I think, I think yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we know Charles well. It's that easy. I'd be very disappointed if Charles didn't uh, support the product. It's a great platform uh, for retail investors. So, I mean, I'm very happy to also give Charles a call and say, "Why aren't we there?" Yeah, no, 100%. He was on, I think, Keith, you poked him on Twitter today, and, and, and his comment was um, that as long as there's liquidity, there is no reason not to list it. I, and I agree with you, Mark. I mean, you know, they, they, it's, a, it's a great platform. It's a great product. Um, and he's he's committed to, if there's a market maker, they will be on on, on easy equities. Uh, Piers also asking, uh, can they be included in the tax-free account? And what about dividends? Are they reinvested or do they pay out? I'm going to tackle the tax-free investment one. Unfortunately, no, uh, SARS doesn't allow it at the moment. It's We have been motivating that, sh that mm -hmm. personal share portfolios or these more active type instruments can be included. And to date, we haven't had luck on that. We'll keep pushing it with the JSC, through the JSC. Uh, but as far as I'm aware, no, at the moment. Um, uh, and then dividends. At the moment, it's uh, dividends are reinvested. They are, these are not income products. So they're not designed for the income to be paid out. Everything is, uh, is is depending on clearly the, the asset manager's choice, the, whether he's taking species or dividend, it is all reinvested. And that's the one tax benefit of an AMC that we forgot to, uh, that I forgot to mention earlier, mm. is if you sit there and you actively trade all these yourself and you're a small cap trader, you might just get hit from a tax point of view. Yeah, Here, it's all within a wrapper. So you don't have to worry about the tax implication of jumping in and out. If uh, uh, Keith decides to change the portfolio every day, shouldn't be a tax issue for you. It's inside the wrapper. No, 100%. Thanks, thanks Mark. If I, if, if I can just add my two cents there, I feel strongly they should be included in tax-free savings accounts, mm -hmm. um, first of all. And then second of all, uh, you pay a lot less capital gains in the long term than you pay on dividend tax trickling out in, yeah. in the short term. Dividend tax 20%, so, um, max CGT is 18 if you're absolutely uh, in the top bracket. Absolutely. So, so you want a compounding product if you're a long-term investor, which suits especially the small and mid-cap space perfectly. Yeah. Uh, on tax-free, I've got a, spoken with my contact in Treasury. Uh, yep, these are currently not available in tax-free, uh, and that's just because of how the legislation was written. Um, I, I think they will be in time. It's just going to be a process, uh, and uh, governments move slowly. Clive, you're asking for fact sheets and documents from the Uminum ones. Uh, the the website you can go at unum.coza but there's an email there as well you can drop them an email uh, they will send details that and i'm going to park it because gents we have hit our time perfectly on we have finished our questions uh to everyone who's attending really appreciate your time uh this evening uh mark keith adrian appreciate your insights great looking products i like these i think this is i, I think this is going to be exciting and and to the to, to, to mark what you were saying, you know, there, there's a space in our world for ETFs. Absolutely, there is. But I think there's a space in our world as well for for sort of that allied product at the same time. And I think that's what AMCs is going to do as as they grow and as we find uh, new ones coming through and listing. Gentlemen, appreciate all your time this evening.